Good afternoon and welcome to the Time Finance PLC Final Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ed Rimmer, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Um, delighted to take you through the uh, results presentation with myself and James Roberts from our year end to 31st of May, and also importantly for the first quarter of the new financial year through to the end of August. Uh, it's probably worth noting before we go into the slides that we've decided not to run through the basics of what the business does, uh, who we are and the markets we operate in directly there. There are three slides at the end of the presentation by way of an appendix which shows this, this information, but we've run through them over the last few presentations. They're similar slides and we're presuming that most people on the presentation on the call know the basic data of what we do now. So um, uh, to, to avoid repetition, we've just included those as appendices at the end. So uh, just to, to kick off, um, by way of introduction, uh, I'm Ed Rimmer, uh, Chief Executive of the business. Uh, just over a year into the, the role, um, I joined at the start of the uh, previous financial year just gone. And overall, it's it's been a challenging year, but it's been uh, quite positive. We've made a lot of progress and and we'll take you through some of that during the course of the presentation. I spent a good chunk of my time um, in the financial services sector with Bibby Financial Services. Throughout that time, always lending to SMEs, 25 years in the industry uh, and 17 years with Bibby, five years of which were as UK Chief Executive. Uh, James. Thanks, Ed. Uh, yeah, good Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's James Roberts. I'm the CFO of Time Finance. Uh, I've been with the business now uh, just over five years. I joined in May 2017. Uh, prior to that, I um, uh, haven't quite got Ed's 25 years experience in FS, but I've got over 20. Uh, I qualified as a chartered accountant with PwC uh, and then have been involved in various uh, financial services firms in various roles, AIM listed uh, global companies, startups, that type of thing. Um, but as I say, yeah, been with time now for just over five years. Thanks, James. Okay, so just to run through an update on our strategic plan. Um, this was conceived, put in place at the start of the last financial year, so the beginning of June 21. Um, and just to run through what we are looking to achieve, uh, become a nationally recognized SME funder in the alternative lending space, more than double our gross lending book up to 250 million pounds, achieve profits organically in excess of the 2019 peak pre, pre-COVID and significantly strengthen our balance sheet through focusing on our own book activities as opposed to our broking activities. So progress, um, well I think positive progress to, uh, certainly in the the last three months of the financial year just gone and, and into the first three months of the new financial year through to the end of August. Um, you can see there the lending book has grown to 143 million. Um, that's up uh, 4% from the, the end of the financial year, so just in the first quarter alone. Um, but from the start of the plan, uh, it's up 24% from the starting point of 116 million. So overall pleasing growth. That's been driven really through the two key offerings as we see our product portfolio, and that's hard asset finance and invoice finance. The growth through hard asset um, from 32 million at the starting point, we've grown 38% up to a book of 44 million at the end of August. And invoice finances has, has recovered significantly since the low points of the pandemic. Uh, we now have a lending book in invoice finance of 45 million, uh, and that's an 80% increase from where we were at the start of the plan. Um, you'll see from the two divisions combined in terms of hard and, and, and invoice finance, 
they make up now just under two thirds of our our business in terms of our our lending volumes. So they're certainly the key parts of our our growth plan. Some other uh, figures just before I go on to what we've been doing um, to improve and, and grow the business. So unearned income, this is the income that we effectively book in the asset and loan finance businesses when we uh, bring on uh, origination new new business. Um, that is now 17 million at the end of August. It was previously 14 million, so an increase of 3 million over the last 15 months, which underpins and, and builds confidence in terms of our future income streams. Um, pleasingly, the growth hasn't been at, at the expense of reducing margins. Uh, growth profit margin has increased um, from 62 to 64% from the launch of the strategy. And also the growth has, has, has not been at the expense of bringing on lower credit uh, quality. We've seen a reduction in our net arrears from 14 million at the start of June 21 down to 9 million at the end of August. So all positive figures. Uh, what have we been doing? Well, um, we set out to simplify the structure. We decided that we were going to focus on being um, an SME business to business lender. We did have a structure previously through some of the acquisitions that the business had made historically, where we had consumer finance businesses that were more heavily regulated and brokerage businesses. Um, we've exited one of those uh, that loss loss making second hand vehicle broking business, um, and we are close to exiting the second one, which is a consumer mortgage brokerage, and that should be completed during the current quarter. Um, that will then position us as as I say as an SME lending business, building predominantly our own book with three core products: asset finance, loan finance, and invoice finance. So. Um, much more simple business for the business, the market, and our introducers to understand. We've invested in in some proven talent, um, as well as the the leaders of the visions that I mentioned. We've also brought in some more experienced salespeople into the, particularly into the hard asset and the invoice finance businesses. So, in terms of leadership, we brought in Sharon Bryden, who joined um, in August last year to head up the loans business. Um, more recently, at the start of this calendar year, Steve Nichols came in to lead the asset finance business. And very recently, we've just appointed Louise Iconomides as head of business improvement. And that is a, a key role that is, is probably the final um, senior appointment that we're looking to make for the, the short term, certainly for the, the foreseeable future. Very much focused on process improvement, uh, project management and um operational efficiency, an area of the business that we have made some strides in, but we've not had any real focus on that from one in accountable individual. Um, Louise has got good experience in that in that field. And importantly, it's aligned to working in the asset finance industry as well through many years. So we're looking forward to what we can do there. And as we grow, we, we, we will um, hopefully grow more efficiently than we we have done historically. We've also focused on developing our multi-products offering, spent some time putting together an asset-based lending product to be launched uh, during the current quarter. That is effectively knitting our current suites of products together and being able to offer them as one. So we can offer a combination of invoice, uh, loans, hard assets, soft assets, um, and also stock funding. And that is all being done through our invoice finance division through our, our finance partners uh, for that division in, in NatWest through our back-to-back our -back facility. So looking forward to gaining some traction there during the rest of the, the current um, trading year. We've also migrated our loans offering, not completely away from unsecured loans. We still offer that product, but we're, we're looking to more focus on the secured lending in, in loans. And as the government guarantee schemes have ended now, the RLS, and prior to that, C-bills, we expect demand for secured loans to start increasing through this year and into next year. Um, and that's something that Sharon Bryden's been focusing on heavily. Um, and also, I mentioned our soft asset offering. It's um, our smaller part of the business. We do have a, a niche in that soft asset market. Um, and we've developed a fast track product to basically progress the smaller deals quick, more quickly. 
Um, we have a natural spread of risk because the average ticket size in that market is around 7K. Um, we're not looking to expand that at the same rate as hard asset and invoice finance, but we do get good margins attached to that smaller business. And as I say, there's a natural hedge. It's really about um, originating them and processing them as eff efficiently as possible. Um, so Fast Track has been launched. We're now in month four and we've gained some good traction in, in that product as well. And finally, we've continued to build our brand. We invested in um, marketing in, in a wider plan um, last year. We've continued that this year. We took on a, um, a relationship with a third party digital marketing agency to increase our online presence. And we've also increased our, our spend with um, our, our, um, our, our normal agency, our PR agency, sorry, um, Truth PR in Manchester. And we're looking to gain more traction through our marketing activities this year. And pleasingly, we saw some, some tangible progress in that. We were ranked uh, joint first in the Business Money Intermediary Index, which is a, a survey amongst the key introducers in the invoice finance market. And um, prior to um, last year, when we were um, ranked number one, we hadn't really featured in the top 10. So that was a, a notable achievement for the, for the team and pleasing to see. So uh, now on to our financial results, and I'll, uh, I'll hand over to James to take you through the following slides. Thanks, Ed. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm going to talk through the, the numbers uh, to the 31st of May, but also factor in the Q1 trading update. Uh, the numbers to the year end um, are pretty much exactly in line with those that we published in our trading update back in July. So I am going to skim over those relatively quickly and spend more time on the quarter one numbers through to the 30th, 30th of August, as they are uh, new numbers that uh, people won't have seen before. So the numbers to the 31st of May, as I said, we, we announced these pretty much uh, in line with this uh, back in July. But just to, to reiterate, uh, I think the word used in the report and accounts by Ed is satisfactory, and we view them as, as satisfactory. That is a good description of them. Um, the balance sheet side of things, probably the first five or five or so bullet points on this table um, are all very, very positive. And the P&L, as it takes time for an own book lending uh, strategy to gather pace, is satisfactory. If we look at these at a high level, we can see own book origination has increased 36 percent. And this is the lifeblood of the business. The more we originate for our own book, we will write on our own book and in time over the length uh, of the, the lease or the loan that will drop into the re business's revenue and in turn profit. Um, so it does take a little bit of time because uh, the average lease or loan is, is three to four years. We'll then between three months and five years, but the average one is very much a bell curve and the average lease is three to four years. Um, so that revenue of those businesses will drop in over three to four years. That has led to the own book lending uh, book grow growing. It's now 137 million or so at the end of May, which is uh, about 18 percent up on the year before. Um, it is relatively easy to lend money. There's a great skill in making sure that money is paid back. And the next two bullet points are, are, are very pleasing for us. The deals in forbearance uh, are now zero. At the height of the pandemic, they were in the tens of millions at the end of 2021's financial year, they were just under a million. And at the end of the year, just finished, uh, they are now nil, which is a fantastic result, we believe, given the effects of the pandemic uh, and reflects the hard work and skill of our credit team. Uh, the net deals in arrears, and this is any deal that could be one day overdue through all the way through the process through to being uh, dealt with in the legal department, uh, has fallen dramatically. About 35% from uh, 14 million or so to 9.3 million at the end of May. Um, and as I say, the balance sheet has strengthened, which is particularly pleasing. Our consolidated net tangible assets now over 30 million at 30.5 million. The PL perhaps hasn't uh, moved to reflect that yet, but as I say, an own book lender takes time for the numbers to throw flow through into the PL. Um, the revenue for the period is down slightly by about 2%. Uh, that's driven by two key factors to draw out. One is included in there in the discontinued operations from our uh, non-core vehicles brokerage that Ed, I mentioned that we divested back in May. If that's removed from continuing operations, our revenue has been flat during the year at about 22 and a half million. Also worth pointing out, though, in the, the numbers to May 21, the year before, there was about 400,000 pounds of government support through furlough income. 
so the true comparator is probably uh, a slight increase from 22.1 million up to 22 and a half. Uh, and those numbers are, are similarly reflected in, in profit before tax and exceptionals, um, which is relatively flat um, on a standard metric. Uh, and it's, it, it is flat on a continuing operations one. You'll see the PBT number is, is quite, quite a lot lower. And that is because there is a significant amount of um, exceptional items in the year, the financial year just finished. Uh, a million pounds of that related to um, the closure of the operation, in the second-hand vehicles operation, and a, a good one-off goodwill write-off of, of a million pounds as a result of that. So the reason it's dri dropped so much is almost entirely due to um, that one-off goodwill impairment, uh, where we removed the goodwill from the vehicles division as we closed it down. So overall, satisfactory for the year through to May 22. Um, but we're particularly pleased with how things are going uh, for the first quarter through to 30th of August 2022. Uh, Ed mentions in some of his reports in, in the report and accounts that we had very positive trading momentum in the final quarter of the last financial year, March, April and May. And that has continued through June, July and August. And when we compare the results at the end of August 22 to a year before at the end of August 21, um, I think both the balance sheet and the PL uh, are, are particularly pleasing, and we can see the momentum beginning to gather speed. So, our own book origination up 26% on the year before, uh, and that's led to the book continuing to grow. So, I said earlier it was 137 million or so at the year end. It's now just shy of 143 million, which is 24% up on the same period uh, at 30th of August 21. Deals in forbearance remain at nil. Uh, and deal arrears have continued to fall. They've gone from the 14.3 at the end of August, uh, 12 months prior, and then it was 9.3, as I mentioned, at the end of May. It's now 9.2. So the book has been growing, and at the same time, the deals in arrears have remained relatively static but have fallen. So as a percentage of the book, they really have come down, which we think is is, is very good in the in the wider macroeconomic environment. Uh, net tangible assets continue to grow. Um, 31.3 million now, which is 9% uh, up on the end of August the year before. Um, and when we look at the PL, this is where we really are beginning to see the effects of the of the strategy in growing the own book. Revenue, 6.3 million for the three months. That's 12% more than the three months, 12 months earlier. Um, profit before tax and exceptionals, a million pounds for the three months compared to 0.4 million. Uh, before and the bottom line PBT, as I mentioned earlier, there's no goodwill write-off uh, that that depressed the May 21 numbers. Um, so we, we're now at 900.9 million uh, compared to 0.4, so 125% up on uh, the three months, 12 months earlier. So overall, um, we think real momentum being shown uh, on the PL now for the first three months and continuing strengthening of the balance sheet. Two other slides from me just before I um, hand back to Ed. Uh, some of these I have mentioned before, but I do think as an own book lender, they're key. Um, you can see here talking about the, the, the balance sheet in a bit more, more depth, three key things, net tangible assets, gross lending book and net arrears. And, and the headlines behind those are, you know, net tangible assets are now at record levels. The gross lending book is back to pre-pandemic levels and the net arrears are now consistently below the pre-pandemic levels. And they're three key Big positives in our mind. Um, despite the effects of the pandemic, you can see on the left-hand side table, net tangible assets have continued to grow throughout that period from 25.4 million back in May 19 to now 31.3 million, as I, as I mentioned. We've remained profitable throughout a very challenging time. Um, the lending book now, again, the middle table you can see is pretty much back to where it was in May 19, pre-pandemic. We were at just under 142 million. We're now just over 142 million uh, as at the end of August. So we've sort of weathered that uh, COVID-induced reduction in the book, and that's uh, really beginning to grow. The highest we've ever had pre-pandemic was about 144 million. So we would expect, hopefully, in the next few months, we'll be uh, having the largest gross lending book that we've ever had uh, if things continue as planned. And the final one, I touched on it uh, about uh, arrears and, and how crucial that is. This graph here shows the arrears since uh, January 19. The purple 
bars are just standard arrears. That's any deal that hasn't quite paid as, as we were expecting from missing one DD because somebody's on holiday or they, it bounced for whatever reason all the way through to what's illegal. The green bars, uh, uh, which are around the sort of May 20 area primarily, that is where we granted forbearance to a number of our clients due to the effects of the pandemic. So you can see the green has gone. As I touched on, uh, there's no balances in forbearance anymore. And crucially, the, the purple bars, the, the net arrears, are now consistently well below the pre-pandemic levels. You can see probably almost for the last year since September 21, the right-hand third of that graphic uh, is consistently below the left-hand third of the graphic, which was the pre-pandemic, and obviously with the big spike in the middle third for the pandemic. Um, so as I touched on, a key point is as the book has been growing, the arrears as a percentage of the book have been shrinking. So the arrears are not growing in line with the the speed of the book growth, which is which is good and shows the higher quality in our book. Pre-pandemic, arrears were around about 10% of the gross book. They rose to just under 20% during the height of the pandemic, far, far higher if you include forbearance as well, um, before falling back probably to May 21, around about 12%. 7% of the year year end just gone, May May 22, and a little bit of a further reduction for the final quarter, as I touched on, we're about 6% of the gross lending book as at the end of August. So three key metrics on the balance sheet, three key positives uh, in my mind. The other one is the book itself. Um, this graphic has been shown before. I've just extended it for another three months, but I think it's quite, it's quite key. It shows how the lockdowns impacted this group. And on the uh, the book. And on the left-hand side, you can see we were just shy of 145 million gross lending. Lockdown one happened. It reduced significantly. When lockdown one ended, it began to grow steadily again, but then reduced again as lockdown two and three happened. And you can see round about the summer of 21, lockdown three ends. And since then, it's been a slow, steady, consistent growth in the own book lending. And that's key, as, I touched, as I've said, because that will drive future revenues and in turn future profits over the three to four year period of the life of an average lease. Um, the other key key metrics that we've mentioned in our strategic plan that's worth drawing out is increasing our average deal size. Since the start of the plan at the end of uh, May 21, the average deal size has grown from about 14,000 to over 20, about 23,000 pounds now, which is an increase of 60%. Uh, in growing this business and growing the book, we haven't taken our, our eye off the risk and we have continued to focus on the spread and diversification of our book, making sure we're not overweight in any one sector in our minds. So our top 10 sectors by value uh, are still less than 30 percent of the overall lending and our largest sector by value is still less than 10 percent of the overall lending. So we've kept those two key metrics on the spread and diversification, which we think de-risks the business. And we feel we've got a sensible approach to provisioning. Um, historically, our provisioning has been around 2% of the book. It now is around about 3%. That's slightly lower than during the pandemic high of 5%, which you would expect as, uh, as we weren't sure of the impact of the pandemic. And it did result in a, a few write-offs, but we're through that now. And we feel uh, unless there's some major change, 3% is probably where we're going to stay, all other things being equal in terms of our provisioning, which we feel is sensible uh, and adequate for the the so, uh, sectors we operate in and the types of business we lend to. Um, so that's the numbers, whistle-stop tour of the numbers. Uh, May 22, as, as we'd said in July, and in our mind, a very solid first quarter's trading, um, which is beginning now to flow in through into the P&L, and we should see the uplifts of that going forward if things continue as they are. And with that, I'll hand back to Ed. Thanks, James. Um, so just by way of, uh, of, of summary and um, bringing things to a, a close, um, we've uh, we've exited the non-core uh, vehicles brokerage, um, which we've mentioned as a as a consistent drag on profits over the last two years. And we've got a well progressed plan to exit the consumer loans business in the current quarter. Um, so, as I said before, that will bring us to a a point of more simplicity where we are an SME business to business lending um, through asset invoice and, and loans. The key leadership and sales hires have been made that we said we would do and, and that's starting to positively impact the growth of the business. Um, we do have something that's different through our, our different products. Lots of our competitors only have one product, whether it be in the invoice finance market or the asset finance market. 
so knitting those together um, is is key and, and always has been something that differentiates us. And I'm pleased to say that we've done quite a bit of work on that and we are going to launch our ABL offering during the, the current year. And we've continued to grow the own book through focusing on hard asset and invoice finance predominantly. And as you can see from the, the slides previously, that's just under now two thirds of our business. And that's where we see the continuing growth or at least the majority of the growth coming from. So in terms of the outlook, um, I think our, our strategy is, is definitely now embedded and, and understood internally in the business through our colleagues, but also externally through the market, particularly through our broker market and our, our introducers. Um, the lending book is expected to continue to grow. Yes, there are challenging economic you know, circumstances around um, that may mean arrears need more focus. SMEs will be more struggling for, for cash availability, but that pr presents good opportunities for us. Um, and that's why we're quietly confident about the rest of this year and, and the future. Um, the medium term aim and the strategy that set has been set out remains the same. Um, momentum is building around that plan um, and um, we're confident of, of delivering it. Relatively early days still, we're into the second year of the plan now, but I think all in all, over the, certainly over the last six months, the progress has been more encouraging um, and um, the momentum should continue to build through the current financial year. So the, the next few slides are just the appendices that I mentioned. Um, these will be available to anyone who wants to see them, um, but it really just recaps previous slides we've done in um, past presentations as to who we are, what we do, the different products that we offer um, and where we sit in the marketplace. Um, and uh, that that is uh, that is it. Um, I'm sure there's been some, some questions come through, so we'll turn to Q&A now. Ed, James, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just using the Q&A tab situated in the top right cor corner of your screen. But just while Ed and James take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And James, if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give response where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you both at the end. Great, thank you. Yes, and thank you for everyone who's um, submitted questions. Uh, we can see there's quite a few coming already, so we will try and answer them to the best of our ability in the time we've got left. Um, first question from uh, Colin C. In July, in the July 22 meeting, there was a question regarding why no updates had been supplied for an extended time. We, you replied this would improve. You were subsequently asked about the direction of the Wellesley Arena 20% stake in the company. You stated you were meeting Arena a week later. To date, there has been no updates on this. Please explain why no communication has been posted and provide a verbal update of the outcome of that meeting. Um, Ed, would you like to take that one or would you like me to? No, no, I'm happy to take that, James. Um, well, I, th I think it, it's been a relatively short time scale since we last presented. Um, in July, so um, and we have done some updates in that time around um, other non-financial uh, positives around the business in terms of some of the appointments we've made. Um, we have just so shareholders are aware, we have agreed as a board that we um, will do a more focused plan this year on retail um, investors. We've got um, some presentations that are lined up uh, this afternoon, and we've also got. Um, some interaction with retail investors planned for the rest of the financial year. So that is a uh, an area of the business that we accepted that last year we were very much more in internally focused and, and we need to um, yeah get out there a bit more and tell people what we do and, and, and talk about the positive things and, and that is part of our plan. Um, in terms of the specifics around the uh, arena stake, um, I'm, I'm afraid um, there's been no update because there's nothing to say. <laughs> nothing to say. Um, yes, a, a meeting took place, as you would expect, with a, a significant shareholder. Um, but aside from Arena being interested in investing in small cap um, FS businesses um, and it being consistent with their strategy, um, um, I'm afraid there's nothing else to tell of, of significance. So um, we will continue to engage with Arena as we do with our other shareholders. 
Um, and if anything materially comes up that I'm um, at liberty to tell uh, the market, then I, I will do. But I'm afraid there's nothing else to tell. So that's why there's been no update. Thanks, Ed. Um, second question also from Colin. There are two good figures in the annual results, own book underwriting up and deals in arrears down. All the other figures are pretty well unchanged from the previous year. The model was theoretically that the own book equals more profitable lending. Other headwinds have receded, COVID, govern, government interference in support, etc. Why has the model not seen results in the profit before tax? Um, it's probably one for me talking about numbers, if that's okay, Ed. Um, yes, in theory, you're right, Colin. The, the, the point is uh, that, that's probably missing from that, though, is timing. Um, as I touched on, own book lending takes time. Um, you build the book and the revenue associated with the, those deals um, drops in monthly for between three months and five years. And as I said, on average, about three and a half years or so. So it builds year on year on year. So it's a slow build, a gradual build. So the increase in the book of the last 12 months will begin bearing benefit over the next two, three years or so. And the increase in the book that we're experiencing this year experiencing this year will then benefit the revenue and the profit moving forward again so it, it's building blocks on top of each other so the fact the origination was up significantly in the last 12 months won't immediately drop through to the to the bottom line that will take time as i say over three or four years or so so what it is showing though is the building blocks are there and we would expect all other things being equal that p and that profit and that revenue to increase over the next few years which q1 i think uh my reading of the Q1 results was that we are beginning to see that that uptick, um, but it's it, it is it is slow. It doesn't happen immediately. Unlike brokerages, if you broke something on, you get the revenue in that month and that's it. Um, but it's lower revenue in the long term. Uh, I hope that um, I hope that answers that question. Um, Toby F, uh, as interest rates rise, is your NIM inevitably going to be squeezed, or can you pass? on rate rises to customers. Um, Ed, are you happy if I take that one? Or? Sure, yeah. yeah okay. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a mixture. Um, if we take our invoice finance business, which, as Ed mentioned, is our, our fastest growing area of the group, um, the, all interest rate rises there are passed on to immediately onto our customers. That's the way that model works. So uh, it actually benefits us slightly with in, in interest rate rises going on. For invoice finance, uh, with the asset and loans divisions, it's it's a mixed bag in that all deals we've already written, both to the the end user deals we've done and the funding we've drawn from our funding partners, are fixed at the point of writing the deal or drawing down the funds. So the existing lending that's out there today isn't impacted by rate rises. Um, it, it is it's fixed both ways. What is impacted is moving forward. Um, future drawdowns from our funding partners will cost us more because they will increase their rates. So that 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 element will will reduce our NIM. On the flip side, we where wherever possible, we will look to pass that on to our customers. So at a high level, it, it, it shouldn't impact us too much, but it may be uh, within some of the subdivisions in asset or loans potentially the NIM could be squeezed, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be anything too material. Uh, Sam asks, what is the impact of higher interest rates on your existing portfolio? I think I've answered that one just before. As I said, the, the, in, the higher interest rates on the invoice finance element will uh, marginally benefit us. The um, higher interest rates on asset and loan has no impact because they're fixed on the existing portfolio. Colin C asks, the employee mixture has changed in the year. You stated you right-sized the organization for a post-COVID world, but the RNS notices have been of more recruitment. There were also significant, there were also recruit, significant recruitment in sales teams when Ed took over, bringing in his own team. Why then has there been no increase in PBT revenue given all these strategic moves? Ed, are you, would you yeah. like to answer that one? Or? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Um so a couple of points there. I think um, if we took it, if we took financial year to May 22 um, on its own, then that would be a fair comment in terms of the increase in profit before tax. Um, as we said in the last presentation, though, in, in July, um, actually 
sixty percent of the profit that we made in the financial year was made in the last half. Forty percent was made in the first half. So we did see that impact starting to positively come through, and that certainly played out in the first quarter. So the figures that James presented. Um, £900,000 we've made in the first quarter versus £400,000 in the first quarter of the previous uh, quarter, respective to the financial year comparison. So um, it, it is starting to um, show through um, and it is starting to show through on the bottom line um, and that should continue through the course of this this year. Um, the, the other point to make in terms of we, we downsize the business or right size the business post-COVID but there has been some um, RNSs of recruitment. That's really just about the roles that they're doing. We, we recognised that we needed to take some people on in sales facing roles and business origination roles. Whereas unfortunately, um, some of the, the roles that we had to make redundant when back office. So that's really just about the actual different roles. It's, it's not comparing like for like in terms of just recruitment um, you know, numbers. It, it one stage of the year versus another stage of the year. It's, it's entirely down to the roles that they fulfil. Thanks, Ed. Um, next question, uh, Colin. Again, it was previously stated that a target was to double the gross lending book to around 250 million over four years. Where are we on that journey? And do you still believe it's achievable without further recruitment? Ed, would you like to do that one or I can? I don't mind. Yeah, I'm happy to do that again. Um, so what well, we saw in the presentation, obviously, where we were on that on that journey, um, 144 million uh, is the is the overall lending book. And that's up from 116 million at the start of the plan. We need to increase broadly 20 percent um, each year compounded for the course of the, the, the remaining time of the plan. Um, and that's been broken down into the, as you'd expect, into the different divisions and what we need to achieve from hard asset finance, invoice finance, loan finance and, and soft asset finance. So each of the teams is aware of what we, we are looking to do. And that's consistent with the numbers that we've we've put out into the market and our, our business plan. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of the numbers were included in the presentation um, and you know, broadly speaking, we're we're on track to achieve what we need to achieve. But clearly, there's still a long way to go. But the business is set up to do that. Thanks, Ed. Uh, next question was the revenues for the year are pretty static for 22 compared to 21. Administrative costs seem very similar. However, profit figure after tax has fallen by near nearly a third. This is not highlighted. Please explain it. Um, I think hopefully I did in the in the the numbers part. Uh, the year to 31st of May 2021 was impacted by a one-off exceptional item, writing off about a million pounds of goodwill uh, associated with the acquisition of the non-core used car vehicle brokerage. So that, as we've touched on, that was divested at the end of the year. Uh, we couldn't carry the goodwill associated with that acquisition anymore. So that was written off so that the profit, the very bottom line, the, the large part of the difference between uh, May 21 and May 22 is because of that uh, one off million pound exceptional write off of goodwill. Uh, Toby F, you point to falling arrears for all types of arrears. Has the mix of depth of arrears changed since 2019? Um, oh, it's probably one for me, is it, Ed? Or, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is going to test my thinking now. No, this, um, no it's a good question. Um, we're relatively sector agnostic, so our book um, throughout our, our various divisions is spread across a, a number of sectors, as we've touched on, um, and there hasn't really been a huge spike in any particular area uh, of arrears. Um, so I don't think the mix has changed that much at all. Um, we have similar levels of, uh, of arrears uh, across the book. Every, pretty much every sector, we, bar a few, were negatively impacted by COVID. And so we did see some increases in arrears there. But generally, the arrears makeup now is pretty similar to it was pre COVID in terms of the sectors it, that they're in. Uh, but as I touched on, uh, pleasingly, they're all a little bit lower than they were uh, three or four years ago. 
Uh, John asks, could Ed comment further on his point in his statement regarding the need to improve employee communications and engagement? Yeah. Um, um, a, a good question, because obviously our, our, our people, our colleagues are absolutely key to what we do. We're a, we're a people business, and that's what differentiates us with a lot of our introducers who pass business to us and the flexibility and the commitment and the speed of response that the the teams provide is is key. I think last year we lost a bit of sight for, with that. Um, we, we, we obviously went through a lot of internal focus restructures and we had to reduce the, the headcounts as well towards the end of the year, which which understandably caused some um, <clears throat> a l- little bit of you know, disturbance with um, with people being a bit more worried about the future. Um, <clears throat> so we, we're focused on that. We need to I- improve, I think, some some dialogue. It's not that we don't do any. We're very focused on delivering month by month communications to all our teams in terms of how the business is performing. Try and get two way communication going. Um, suggestions of how we can improve the business and how people are feeling. Um, we're obviously in the midst of a, a whole different wave of unsettlement at the moment with regards to inflationary pressures, cost of living increases, um, and all the things that everyone else is suffering from and aware of. Um, so that's something that we are, we have a plan for. Um, so I think it's just really recognising that and, um, and putting a, a bit more structure um, around what we need to do to better improve um, communication and, and engagement and we, we do have a plan for that this year thanks ed uh, another question from john was to what extent has the pnl benefited from the reduction in bad debt provisions um i'll take that one if if, if that's okay um in a nutshell it, it hasn't so the reduction in bad debt provisions is has been due to uh, an increase in write-offs as you'd expect we increased our bad debt provision uh as COVID hit and during COVID, because we feared some uh, businesses would unfortunately um, not survive. And there was an uptick in in write-offs during the COVID period. Um, That's uh, leveled out now and we're back to um, normal range, if you want to call it that. So the provision was made to cover that increase and then it was used to write off a few of those uh, deals that went wrong during the COVID, uh, the COVID period. So there was no benefit to the PL from the, the reduction in the, in the bad debt provisions. Uh, probably one for you here, Ed. Sam has asked, should you be considering a merger in order to, in order to reach scale and reduce your significant overheads? Yeah, thank you, James. Uh, <laughs> um, we're, we're focused very much on growing our business as, as it stands. We believe there's a good opportunity for a business like Time Finance to do that. We, we, we think we're the right scale to be able to compete now. We're bigger than some of the small micro players that are owner-manager businesses, but we're not as big as obviously some of our larger independent and certainly nowhere near as big as the bank competitors. So we believe we've got a good position in the market to offer we, what we think is crucial to SMEs flexibility, common sense lending and approach to um, business and commerciality. Um, all those things are still still key. Clearly, if opportunities come along that are presented to us and they make sense for shareholders, then we will consider them in the normal course of business. As you can imagine, businesses like ourselves have approaches, discussions, um, um, suggestions of this, that and the other pretty much all the time. Um, but as I say, the board will you know, um, pay due consideration to them as and when they progress to being something meaningful. Um, there's always opportunities out there that the business could become bigger uh, as being part of something else. Um, but as I say, we believe as a standalone business, we have a very good opportunity and we're on a, a good path towards achieving the uh, the objectives set out. Um, one point just to note in there in terms of reducing your significant overheads I think we, we we noted that we did have some um, significant overheads in the business for the size of the business, and that's why we went through the reductions that we did do at the end of last year. We do carry some additional overhead through being a PLC, a listed business, as you'd expect, um, that we wouldn't carry if we were part of something else or under private ownership. Um, but it, it's, it's not millions and millions of pounds. Um, so... The significant overheads that we have for running our business now 
um, they're not as significant as they were um, and they wouldn't be significantly reduced by being part of something bigger. They would be reduced, but yeah, as I say, it's it's not multi-millions of pounds. Thanks, um, Ed. So uh, I think there's two two questions left, unless uh, some others come in. Uh, um, Alan asks, will the increase in interest rates be passed on to customers? Ed, are you, you okay to take that one? Well, I think we've answered it, haven't we? Um, so, um, yeah, no, no real um, reason to repeat that, James. You, you answered it in the previous uh, question, so... Um... Yeah, good point. Yes, I did. Sorry. Um, uh, and then finally, Colin uh, asks, uh, um, assuming the UK base rate reaches 5%, what will happen to the time finance model? Increasing own book profits, greater arrears, lower revenue. Um, do you want that one, Ed, or shall yeah, I? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so I think I, I, we was interesting because I was talking about this this morning um, with um, with somebody um, we, we've all really been used to what I refer to as um, a false economy over the last 14 years now um, through interest rates, uh, the levels they've been. Many people, obviously, prior to 2008 will remember that you know, a base rate of 4% or, or 5% or even higher was normal. Um, so I think interest rate increases up to those levels will bring UK small businesses, the UK economy back to some form of normality um, as to what things should be like in terms of the real cost of businesses borrowing money. Um, I don't think it's a, a necessarily a, a bad thing. I think that, that the real worry and, and, and possibly concern is around it happening at the same time as lots of other things are happening in the world. Um, so I think that's the, the bigger worry. Um, but in terms of our business, well, <clears throat> it would um, it, it wouldn't lower revenue, it would increase revenue. Um, if we manage our book properly, it should increase profits. Of course, there's a worry around arrears increasing, but that's down to our model in terms of people being engaged with what we do and having close relationships with customers, brokers and clients. Um, so overall, whilst it's a challenge for businesses, I think it's a, an opportunity for businesses like ours. Thanks, Ed. I think that's I think that's all the questions. Yes, Ed, James, thank you very much for that. I think you actually managed to answer every single question from investors. And of course, the company will review those questions submitted today and will publish such responses on the InvestMeet company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you both. Ed, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Certainly. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, again, for, for joining. Um, without really repeating too much of what we've, we've, we've both said, myself and James, um, yeah, steady progress last year, satisfactory results, good progress in the final uh, quarter of last year, much better progress in the first quarter of this year. Um, clearly, we'll see where we get to with lots of the macroeconomic developments, but increase in interest rates, tightening of credit, um, availability of, of cash from businesses like ours on the back of reducing government support. Um, I think puts us in a good position. So we're looking forward to the rest of the year with cautious optimism. Ed, James, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Time Finance PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Good afternoon to you all.